In the VCF voltage controlled filter section, we have already taken into our own hands the knobs managing the oscillators 1 and 2, the sub oscillator, as well as the noise here. Let's see the rest of the elements that are found above. Let's study the elements of this filter in the first place on a white noise with the help of some boards and a spectrum analyzer. The Oberheim SCMV filter can generate four types of pure filters and two rather hybrid filters. We can select these types of filters via this knob here. When completely turned to the left, the filter gets positioned in bandpass filter mode, which, as we notice on this graphic, enables to filter the low and high frequencies in relation to the cutoff frequency defined by the big frequency knob here. As soon as we move the small knob to the right, we generate a low pass filter. As we see on the graphic, the low pass filters the high frequencies by letting the low frequencies pass which are lower than the cutoff frequency. Let's notice that the Oberheim SEMV, like the original, has a low pass filter with a 12 dB per octave slope. Some synthesizers, such as the Moogs or ARP, have 24 dB per octave slopes, which brings a more abrupt filtering. When we continue to move the knob to the right, we have there a hybrid filter between a low pass filter and a notch filter. When we bring this knob to the center, we find there a notch filter. This kind of filter cuts the frequencies located around the cutoff frequency by letting the peripheral frequencies pass that are the low and high frequencies. What's particular on the Oberheim SEMV here is that, as we have sketched, we can obtain a hybrid filter made by a low pass filter and notch filter. We notice well with this position that the high frequencies are more filtered in relation to the low which makes the logic of the low pass filter clear, but we also notice the frequential hole characteristic of the notch filter. When we push this knob completely to the right, we find the high pass filter, which is simply the opposite of the low pass filter. Here, the low frequencies are filtered and the frequencies above the cutoff frequency are let go. The same way as with the low pass filter, we can, with this high pass filter, generate a hybrid with the notch filter when the knob is located between its central and extreme right position. For example, here, we notice that the low frequencies are filtered in relation to the high frequencies, but we also notice the presence of the frequential hole created by the notch filter. We find on the filter the classic resonance here, which enables, as we notice, to amplify the frequencies located around the cutoff frequency, which make this cutoff frequency's movements more ringing and whistling. This resonance is important for the five following filters, band pass filter, low pass filter, low-pass plus notch, high-pass filter, high-pass filter plus notch. When the pure notch filter is selected, the resonance impact will be to tighten the width of the frequential hole. This way the notch filter impact becomes more discreet on the sound. Obviously, all these filters would be more musical when we use them on a wave shapes rather than on noise. I used the noise here to show well the filter's influence on the whole harmonic spectrum, but let's see how a low pass filter can act on a saw wave. This becomes particularly efficient when the resonance is present. 
Same with the high pass filter, which gives the impression that the sound floor disappears and comes back. Let's get back on the low pass filter by double clicking on the knob here. The last function to see in the VCF section is the possibility to modulate the filter cutoff frequency by choosing the envelope 2, the LFO1 or the LFO2. Let's choose the LFO2 for the occasion and take advantage of this to describe the functionalities of this LFO2. Just before, let's play a note and move here the filter's cutoff frequency with the mouse. We hear well this movement's impact. And now, let's deliver to the LFO2 this cutoff frequency's control. You need to give some modulation gain here. This modulation speed is controlled on the LFO2 by the rate. In other words, with a 1 Hz rate, the modulatory oscillations are in sync with the second since the Hz is the unit measuring the periodic wave number within a given second. As opposed to the LFO1, we can, on this LFO2, change the wave shape. In this way, by choosing the ramp shape here, we hear the cutoff frequency's modulation that is in sync with the LFO ramp wave shape here. If we stay in the opposite zone of this modulation gain, we generate a modulation respecting the initial LFO wave shape, but if we pull this modulation gain toward the negative values, the created impact will be to inverse the LFO wave shape. This way, we now hear more jumpy modulations on the cutoff frequency, which respects the drawing of the inverse ramp wave shape. By giving a quite a bit of modulation negative gain, by staying on this ramp wave shape, and by increasing this modulation speed on the LFO rate, we get an interesting jumpy effect which can be fun to use on held chords, for example. If we wish to make these hops in sync on different rhythmic ratios in relation to the project's tempo, you need to activate the synchronization switch here on the LFO. We can choose among several rhythmic factors. The interest being that the LFO is always synchronized to the BPM, without banging your head against the wall. The last LFO wave shape is the square wave. By setting the modulation speed around 13 Hz, by disactivating the LFO2 modulation on the filter, and by activating the LFO2 modulation on the oscillator's pitch, by choosing the square wave as the wave shape on the oscillator, by playing a note on an appropriate pitch, we can recreate a fairly convincing office telephone ring. The fade-in function here enables to progressively amplify the LFO's amplitude as soon as a note is pushed. Manually, with the help of the mouse, this function can be reproduced by giving progressively a modulation on this modulation gain knob. Now, let the fade-in take care of that. The fade-in's length is, as we notice, parametrable. To understand the retrig function here, let's use the ramp wave as a LFO source. Let's lower this LFO's frequency around 0.50 Hz. Turn off the fade-in, but let's continue to modulate the oscillator's frequency. 
When this retrig functionality is not active, the LFO follows its cycle internally, that is to say, when we push a note, it will immediately reach the place where the LFO cycle is at. This provides the fact that on each pushed note, we are likely to hear the sound at the various moments of this LFO curve. Whereas, by activating this retrig switch, every time we push a note, the LFO modulation will start again at its cycle beginning. To finish with this LFO 2, you got to know that the latter is of monophonic nature in relation to the LFO 1, which is of polyphonic nature. Let's get back to the LFO 1 to understand the difference. If, for instance, I play a low note, we notice that the latter is naturally influenced by the sinus cycle of the LFO 1. Now, let's play another high note and realize that its modulation cannot be in phase as far as its movement in relation to the other lower note. Therefore, the LFO1 is polyphonic. In other words, each polyphony voice can have its independent LFO cycle. Now, realize that by using the LFO2, this independence is not present any longer. Both notes will always be in phase as far as their modulation movement.